January 16, 1941, North Atlantic, 400 miles west of Ireland. The wind howls across the deck of HMS Bulldog as a Royal Navy boarding party clambers onto the slanting hull of a crippled German U-boat. The submarine, U-10, is sinking fast, its crew already abandoning ship. Cold spray lashes the faces of the British sailors as they pry open the hatch and drop into the flooded interior. Inside, the air is thick with oil and seawater. One man's boots splash through the dark corridor toward the radio room. He finds it, a metal box covered with dials and keys, the Enigma machine. Next to it, soddy code books dripping with salt water. Grab everything, he shouts. Charts, logs, anything with letters. They haul the machine and documents up through the narrow hatch, just as the U-boat groans and slips beneath the surface. No one realizes it yet, but that desperate salvage in a freezing Atlantic storm has just handed the Allies their most important weapon, the key to Germany's most secret language. But even with the machine in hand, the message inside remains a mystery. Each dawn, the Germans change their encryption settings, rendering yesterday's work useless. Somewhere back in Britain, a quiet war is about to begin, not with bombs or bullets, but with wires, logic, and mathematics. That war will be fought not by soldiers, but by thinkers, men and women working in secrecy at a place the government calls simply Bletchley Park. And among them, is a mathematician named Alan Turing, brilliant, eccentric, and painfully aware that time is running out. Each day, Allied convoys vanish beneath the Atlantic. Each night, the Enigma speaks, sending orders that no one can read. The war, Turing knows, will not be won by force alone. It will be won by understanding. He arrives at Bletchley under gray skies and silence. The mansion looms like a ghost of Victorian wealth, surrounded by rows of wooden huts buzzing with typewriters, cigarette smoke, and the low hum of decoding machines. Somewhere in those walls, beneath the chatter of Morse and the rhythm of teleprinters, the fate of the war hides, waiting to be solved like an impossible equation. Turing takes off his hat studies the streams of intercepted messages pouring in from the listening stations and quietly says to no one in particular, if we can build a machine that thinks faster than a man, we might just have a chance. Outside, the rain begins to fall. Inside, the race against Enigma has begun. Bletchley Park, February 1941. The sun never really rises here, only brightens the mist. Inside Hut 8, Alan Turing hunches over a stack of cipher sheets, tapping a pencil against his teeth. Around him, young women from the Women's Royal Naval Service feed coded intercepts through typewriters, transcribing endless streams of nonsense letters QFX, HJL, TQK. Every morning, new messages arrive, and by nightfall, every single one of them is useless. The German Navy changes its Enigma settings daily, three rotors, each wired in 26 different ways, with a plug board allowing billions of possible combinations. Even if the Allies captured one machine, it means nothing without the day's settings. Turing knows brute force alone is hopeless. To him, the Enigma isn't just a machine, it's a pattern hidden in chaos, a rhythm in noise. Somewhere inside that mess of letters, logic still lives. At his workbench, he sketches circuits and rotors, equations and pathways. Then he looks up at the clock, 3 a.m. again, coffee gone cold, rain tapping on the window. His assistant Gordon Welchman leans in. Alan, you really think a machine can outthink Enigma? Turing doesn't look up. He murmurs, not outthink, outpace. He explains the vision a machine that could simulate the logic of Enigma itself, cycling through thousands of rotor settings automatically, faster than any human hand could turn. It would exploit what Turing calls cribs, predictable words the Germans might use like Vetter for weather reports or Heil Hitler for signatures. 
If they could guess even one small piece of a message correctly, the machine could eliminate millions of impossible combinations, narrowing down the key for that day. It sounds absurd. No one's ever built anything like it. The government calls it impossible. But Bletchley's huts are filled with impossibilities. Linguists, crossword champions, chess players, and classicists, all working towards the same impossible goal. Soon, the first prototype takes shape in a converted garage, a towering frame of spinning drums, whirring wires, and clattering relays. Its name is simple, almost modest, the bomb. When they switch it on, the machine comes alive with mechanical thunder, the sound of logic in motion. Lights blink, rotors spin, and after long, aching hours, the bomb stops on a single configuration. Turing stares at the printout. A few words emerge from the fog of letters. Coordinates? Convoy positions? Times? He exhales, barely whispering, We've got them. For the first time in months, the Atlantic may belong to the Allies again. But this victory is fragile. The Germans are already upgrading their machines, adding a fourth rotor, doubling the complexity. The race isn't over. It's only accelerating. Outside Hut 8, the snow begins to fall over the English countryside. Inside, the bomb's drums spin faster, matching the heartbeat of a war decided by mines instead of armies. March 1943, North Atlantic Convoy Route. The sea is black glass under a full moon. Sixty merchant ships crawl westward, engines thudding, carrying food, fuel, and weapons, the lifeline of Britain. Beneath them, in the frozen dark, German U-boats prowl like sharks. Surface contact, starboard side, the alarm echoes through a Royal Navy destroyer. Searchlights cut across the waves, and depth charges roll overboard, booming into the night like thunder underwater. For years, these convoys have been slaughtered in silence. German Admiral Karl Donitz's U-boat Wolfpacks knew exactly where to strike, guided by encrypted orders from Enigma messages that the Allies couldn't read in time. Until now, back at Bletchley Park, the air is thick with cigarette smoke and the hum of rotating drums. The Bombay machines run day and night, row after row, decoding intercepted traffic from German naval commands. Alan Turing's team no longer sleeps much. Every few hours, the phones ring, messages from the Y stations along Britain's coast, another Enigma intercept, another code to break before dawn. In one message, a phrase repeats, Convoy Mitte, 2100 Stunden. The Bombay clatters and spins, its gears grinding through the night, until at last the machine halts. A single line of text prints out. Coordinates, latitude and longitude, a German wolf pack's position. Within minutes, the information travels to the Admiralty. Orders go out to the escort commanders at sea. Change course. The convoy veers south in the darkness unaware that a pack of submarines now waits above an empty patch of ocean. When the sun rises, the merchant ships are still afloat, and somewhere beneath them, German radio operators report confusion to headquarters. Their commander, frustrated, demands answers. He says, the British must be guessing. But he's wrong. The British aren't guessing. They're listening. For the first time, the Allies are ahead of Enigma. Not by chance, but by mathematics. Still, Turing knows every victory is temporary. The Germans will alter the machine again. The settings will shift. The logic will tangle itself anew. Each day begins with the same fight, decoding the enemy's thoughts before they reach the sea. By the end of 1943, the numbers begin to change. Sinkings drop. Convoy arrivals rise. The tide, once ruled by the U-boat, is turning. And in the quiet, windowless huts of Bletchley Park, Alan Turing sits beside the humming Bombays, pencil in hand, watching the lights flicker. Each blink is a heartbeat of the war. Each pause, a life saved somewhere in the Atlantic. He doesn't smile. He simply nods once, murmuring to himself. This, this is what thinking looks like. Bletchley Park 
late 1944. The war has shifted. Allied forces are pushing through France, the Luftwaffe is stating, and in the Atlantic, the once feared U-boats are dying faster than they can launch. But inside the huts of Bletchley, the work hasn't stopped, and it never will, not until the final message is decrypted, the final code broken. Alan Turing sits at his desk, thinner now, his eyes dark from months without rest. Around him, the walls are covered in scrawled equations and rotor diagrams, the floor littered with half-empty teacups and crumpled paper. The machines still hum, dozens of bombs now, whirring in synchronization like the gears of a living brain. Yet, for all the victories, Bletchley remains a world of secrecy. No cheering crowds, no headlines, no medals. Every success must be hidden beneath silence. Even among colleagues, the rule is clear. Never ask what another hut is doing. Never speak outside these walls. Messages that could save convoys also mean decisions that cost lives. If the Germans ever suspected Enigma was broken, they would change everything instantly. So sometimes Turing and his team must hold back intelligence, allowing one ship to fall so that a dozen others may live. That burden weighs heavier than any metal. Late one night, as snow drifts past the dark windows, Turing receives a visitor, Commander Edward Travis, head of the code-breaking effort. He places a hand on Turing's shoulder. You've done it, Alan. We can read nearly every German message within a day. Turing nods, but there's no triumph in his eyes. Then it's only a matter of time, he says softly, before they realize they've lost the war and don't yet know why. Outside, the generators rumble. Inside, the night shift begins again. Rows of operators in uniform tending to the machines like monks to an altar. They don't know it yet, but Bletchley's work is shortening the war by years, saving millions of lives without a single gun fired. And when the victory finally comes, it will arrive quietly for them. No parades, no announcements, just silence. Orders to pack up, burn documents, and never speak of what happened here. For Turing, the silence will outlast the war. He will be celebrated in secret, forgotten in public, and punished by the country he saved. But long after the last code is cracked and the last machine dismantled, his work will endure in the circuitry of computers, in the logic that defines an age, and in the invisible line between human thought and machine intelligence. Because in the darkest hours of the Second World War, one man proved that the greatest weapon of all was not firepower, but reason. Alan Turing didn't just help end a war, he redefined what it meant to think.